Okay. Let this dread be for the telling of the story, nothing else. The story of how I rescued a vampire, which I wasn't going to tell them. I put my mug down because my hands were beginning to shake. I crossed my arms over my breast and began rocking back and forth in my chair. Pat dragged his chair over next to mine, gently pulled my hands down, held them in his. They were a pale blue now and not so knobbly. I couldn't see if he still had the six fingers. I said, speaking to Pat's pale blue hands, I didn't hear them coming. I spoke in a high, peculiar voice I didn't recognize as my own. But you don't, do you, when they're vampires? There was a growl from Theo, not what you would call a human growl. It was a creepy, chilling, menacing sound, even knowing that it was made on my behalf. Briefly, hysterically, I wanted to laugh. It occurred to me that maybe I hadn't been the one human in the room a few minutes ago when I felt like a rabbit in headlights. Jesse let the silence stretch out a little, and then he said softly, How did you get away? There was another muddle leaning up against the wall in front of us, someone sitting cross-legged, head bowed, forearms on knees. I didn't realize till it raised its head with a liquid and human motion that it was another vampire. I took a deep breath. They had me shackled to the wall in, in what I guess was the ballroom in, in one of the really big old summer houses. At the lake. I, I was some kind of prize, I think. They, they came in to look at me a couple of times. Left me food and water. The second day, I transmuted my jackknife into a shackle key. You transmuted worked metal? I took another deep breath. Yes, no. I shouldn't have been able to. I'd never done anything close. I hadn't done anything at all in 15 years since the last time I saw my gran. It almost, it almost didn't occur to me to try. I shivered and closed my eyes. No, don't close your eyes. I opened my eyes. Pat squeezed my hands. Hey, it's okay, he said. You're here. I looked at him. He was almost human again. I wondered what I was. Was I almost human? Yeah, he said. What you're thinking? I tried to look like I might be thinking what he thought I was thinking, whatever that was. SOF is full of others and part bloods because it's vampires that are our problem. Sure, there are lousy, stinking demons and bad magic crosses. But there are lousy, stinking humans, too. We take care of the others, and the straight cops take care of the humans. If we got the suckers sorted, the humans would calm down sooner or later, let the rest of us live, you know. And then we'd be able to organize and really get rid of the ubies and the goblins and the ghouls and so on, and we'd end up with a relatively safe world. There was a story, I hoped it was no more than a myth, that the reason there still wasn't a reliable prenatal test for a bad magic cross was the prejudice against part bloods. Jesse said patiently, you transmuted worked metal. I nodded, do you still have the knife? I dragged my mind back to the present. I'd decided earlier that the light in the office was good enough, so I nodded again. Can we see it? Pat let go of my hands, and I pulled the knife out of my fuzzy pocket and leaned forward to lay it on a pile of paper on Jesse's desk. It lay there looking perfectly ordinary. Jesse picked it up and looked at it. He passed it to Theo, who looked at it too, and offered it to Pat. Pat shook his head. Not when I'm coming down. It might crank me right back up again, and we can't keep the door locked all night. What would happen if someone knocked, I said. You're still a little blue around the edges. Closet, said Pat. Nice big one. Why we chose Jesse's office. And we would be so surprised that the door was locked, said Jesse. Must be something wrong with the bolt. We'll get it checked tomorrow. Miss Seddon is all right, isn't she? Miss Seddon is fine, I lied. What was wrong with her was not their fault. Ray said Jesse and hesitated. I was holding myself here in the present in this office, so I was pretty sure I knew what he wanted to ask. I don't know, I said. I haven't been back to the lake since. There's a really big bad spot behind the house. Maybe that's part of why they chose it. And when, when I got out of there, I just followed the edge of the lake south. If we take you out there, let's say tomorrow, will you try to find it? It had little to do with what I hadn't told them that made the silence last a long time before I answered. What I told them was plenty for why I didn't want to go there again. Yes, I said at last heavily. I'll try. There won't be anything. I know, said Jesse, but we still have to look. I'm sorry. 
I nodded. I picked up my jackknife and put it back in my pocket. I looked at Jesse, then I looked at the blood-smeared table knife lying on his desk, and he watched me looking. That's the next thing, isn't it, he said. Okay, you have some kind of line on worked metal, some pretty astonishing line it must be, but that doesn't explain. The phone rang. He picked it up. Ah, well, better send him up then. We all looked hard at Pat. He wasn't blue at all. Theo unlocked the door. Mel came, Mel came through it about ten seconds later, looking fit to murder battalions of SOFs with nothing more than a table knife. What the Darmic hell do you red-eyed boys think you're up to, keeping a law-abiding member of the human public incommunicado for over an hour? I managed to keep a straight face. Red-eyed boy or girl is an accusation of utter blood, just the sort of thing a pissed-off civilian would say to a SOF. They all looked perfectly blank. Sorry, said Jessie. We didn't mean to keep her incommunicado. We were getting her out of a bad situation as fast as possible. Brought her in the back way, of course. The media jokers can't get to her here. But we forgot to send word to the front desk that we weren't er holding her. Sure you forgot, I thought. Mel, still quivering with fury and equally aware Jessie was lying, turned to me. I'm okay, I said. I was a bit hysterical. They let me have a shower, I added inconsequently. I'd had a rough night, and it was getting harder and harder to remember what I'd told whom and why. A shower, said Mel, taking in my fuzzy bunny clo clothing, probably the first time he'd ever seen me in anything that didn't involve red or pink or orange or yellow, or at least peacock blue or fluorescent purple. And I realized he didn't know what had happened. He wouldn't, would he? You don't destroy vampires by rushing up to them and sticking them with table knives. The only sure thing about the night's events was that there had been some kind of fracas, some messy kind of fracas, and I'd disappeared with some SOFs. There were probably half a dozen incompatible versions of what had happened out there by now. No wonder Mel was feeling a little wild. It's sort of a long story, I said. May I leave now, please? Before you start asking me about tonight, I thought. That's what I'm here for, said Mel, throwing another good glare around. See you tomorrow, said Jessie. What, said Mel? I'll tell you on the way out, I said. Sleep well, said Pat. You too, I said. They gave me my soggy clothes and a plastic mega food bag, and I managed to jam my feet into the clammy, curled-up sneakers so I could walk. Jesse offered to call a taxi, but I wanted some outdoor air, even Midtown Civic Center outdoor air. We had to go back to the coffee house. The wreck was there. Mel had walked over. Well, I don't know about walked. He had come over without vehicular assistance anyway. He was still putting out major anger vibes, even after a successful rescue of the damsel from the dragon-encircled tower. The dragon had been blue and essentially friendly. The real problem was about the damsel. I had never wanted someone to talk to so badly, never been so unable to say what I wanted to talk about. And if I managed to tell him, what was he going to say? I'll start ringing up residential homes for the lethally loony tomorrow, see where the nearest openings are. Don't even try to tell me what happened till you've had some sleep, said Mel. The goddamn nerve of those guys. I thought Pat and Jesse were okay. I think they are okay, I said regretfully. In some ways it would have been easier if they weren't. Jesse and Theo did get me out of there, um, and they couldn't help being, you know, professionally interested. Mel snorted, if you say so. Listen, the whole neighborhood is talking about it, whatever it is. The official SOF report, what they've already fed to the media goons, is that you were an innocent bystander. None of us is going to say anything, but there were a lot of people in that alley by the time Jesse and Theo got you away, and it's unanimous that you were... There was a pause. I didn't say anything. He added, Charlie seemed to think Jesse was doing you a favor, that SOF could protect you better than we could. Yeah, further destruction of personal worldview optional. Mel sighed, so we hung around the phone at the coffee house waiting, Charlie and me. We sent everybody else home, including Kenny, swore on pain of having his liver on tomorrow's menu not to tell your mother anything. The phone didn't ring, so then we rang SOF and got yanked around by some little sheepwood on the switchboard, and that's when I came over. I'm sorry, I said. The coffee house was dark, and the square 
silent and empty, although there was some kind of distantly audible fuss going on somewhere. It was easy enough to guess was a block or two over and down a recently defiled alley. We went round the side of the coffee house, and I could see a light on in the office. Charlie drinking coffee and pacing. He had his arms wrapped around me so tight I couldn't breathe, almost before I was inside. Charlie is such a mild little guy most of the time. I'm okay, I said. Charlie gave a deep, shuddering sigh, and I remembered him backing me up with Mr. Responsible Media. I also remembered all the time he'd spent in years past encouraging my mundane interest in learning to make a mayonnaise that didn't crack. How much garlic went into Charlie's famous hash, my early experiments with what turned out to be the ancestors of bitter chocolate death at all. There was no magic about Charlie, nor about most restaurants come to that. Human customers tend to be a little twitchy about anything more magical than a waitress who could keep coffee hot. I wondered about my mother's motive in applying for a job as a waitress all those years ago. I was already making peanut butter and chocolate chip cookies while we were still living with my dad, if there was a grown-up to turn the oven on for me, and if she was looking for nice, safe outlets. Tonight, it's, it's connected with what happened when I was gone those two days. I was afraid of that, said Charlie. Jesse wants me to try to find the place it all happened, out at the lake. They're taking me out there tomorrow. Oh, bloody hell, said Mel. It's been two months. They don't have to go tomorrow. I shrugged. Might as well. I have the afternoon off. The lake, said Charlie thoughtfully. I told everyone I'd driven out to the lake. I hadn't said that what happened afterward also happened at the lake. Till tonight, my official memory had ended sitting on the porch of the old cabin. Yes, I was her held at a house on the lake. They want me to try to find it. Either Mel or Charlie could have said, when did you remember this? What else do you remember? Why did you tell SOF when you haven't told us? Neither of them did. Mel put his arm around me. Oh, gods and friggin' angels, he said. Be careful, said Charlie. One of the few advantages to getting to work at 4.30 a.m. is that you can be pretty sure of finding a parking space. When I come in later, I'm not always so lucky. I'd had to park the wreck in a garage lot that evening, and it was locked at 11. Mel took me home. When we got there and he turned the bike off, the silence pressed against me. The sudden quiet is almost always loud when you've been on a motorcycle and got somewhere and stopped and turned it off, but this was different. Mel didn't say any more about the night's events. He didn't say any more about SOF taking me out to the lake the next day. I could see him wanting to, but as I've said before, one of the reasons Mel and I were still seeing each other after four years was because we could not talk about things sometimes. This included that we both knew when to shut up. It was blissful spending time with someone who would leave you alone. I loved him for it, and I was happy to repay in kind. It had never occurred to me that leaving someone alone could harden into a habit that could become a barrier. It had never occurred to me before now. I had to repress the desire that he not shut up this time. I had to repress the desire to ask him if I could talk to him. But what could I have said? We stood there in the darkness for a minute or two. He was rubbing another of his tattoos, the sand wheel, on the back of his left hand. Then he came with me to check that I still had Kenny's bicycle and the tires weren't flat. Then he kissed me and left. See you tomorrow is all he said. I reached over my head to touch the wards strung along the edge of the porch roof on my way indoors. These were all Yolandis. Her wards were especially good, and I'd often thought of asking her where she got them, but you didn't really ask Yolandi questions. I had noticed that her niece, when she was visiting, didn't seem to ask questions either, beyond, I'm taking the girls downtown, can I bring you anything? And the answer would probably be, no, thank you, dear. I wiggled my fingers down the edges of my pots of pansies on the porch steps to check that the wards I'd buried there were still there and that a ping against my fingers meant they were still working. I straightened the medallion over my downstairs door and lifted the go-away mat in front of the one at the top of the stairs to check that the warding built into the lay of the planks of the floor hadn't been hacked out by creature or creatures unknown. I fluttered the charm paper that was wound round the railing of my balcony to make sure it was still alive, blew on the, fl blew on the frames of my windows 
for the faint ripple of response. I didn't like charms, but I wasn't naive enough not to have good basic wards, and I'd been a little more meticulous about upkeep in the last two months. Then I made myself a cup of chamomile tea to damp down the scotch and the cheese. I took off the bunny pajamas and put on one of my own nightgowns. The toilet paper had helped. There wasn't any blood on the SOF thing. I put my still wet clothes in a sink full of more soap and water. Tomorrow I would put them through a washing machine. I might throw them out anyway or burn them. I still hadn't burned the cranberry red dress. It lived at the back of my closet. I think I knew I wasn't going to burn it after the night I dreamed that it was made of blood, not cloth, and I'd pulled it out of the closet that night in the dark and stroked and stroked the dry, silky, shining fabric, which was nothing like blood, nothing like blood. My sneakers would live. I had dozens of t-shirts and jeans if I decided I wanted to burn something, but I wasn't going to sacrifice a good pair of sneakers if I could help it. I pushed open the French doors and went out and sat on my little balcony. It was a clear, quiet night with a bright quarter moon. When Yolandi had had mice in her kitchen, I had set take them alive traps and driven the results 20 miles away and released them in empty farmland. Warts against wildlife are notoriously bad, hence the electric peanut butter fence to keep the deer from eating Yolandi's roses. And a house ward successful against mice and squirrels would be almost the money spinner that a charm to let suckers walk around in daylight would be. I couldn't kill anything larger than a house fly. I'd stopped putting spiders outdoors after I read somewhere that house spiders won't survive. When I dusted, I left occupied cobwebs alone. I hadn't drawn blood and anger since the seventh grade playground wars. I don't eat meat. I'm too squeamish. It all looks like dead animals to me. On the days I cover in the main kitchen, the only hot food is vegetarian. Maybe my mother had successfully coerced and brainwashed her daughter into being a nice human wimp. But I'd blown it. I'd blown it because when I'd turned my knife into a key, because it was the only way to stay alive. Because, maybe only because I didn't know any better, I wanted to stay alive. I looked down at my arms, at my hands cupping the tea mug, as if I would start growing scales or fur or warts or turning blue immediately. Most demon blood doesn't make you big or strong or blue, though, whether it comes with magic ability or not. A lot of it makes you weaker or stupider or crazier. I'd been doing okay as my mother's daughter. My life wasn't perfect, but whose was? Yes, I'd always despised myself for being a coward, a wuss. So, there are worse things. And then I had to drive out to the lake one night. They'd started it. And I may be a wuss, but I've never liked bullies. Maybe, if it was all about to go horribly wrong, I could at least go out with a bang. How cute and sweet and winsome and philosophically high-minded that I didn't like bullies, that I wanted to go out with a bang. I was still a coward. I had a master vampire and his gang on my tail. I was all alone, and I was way out of my league. Oh, Constantine, I whispered into the darkness. What do I do now? I slept the moment my head touched the pillow, in spite of everything that had happened. It was very late for me, though, and I'd had two generous, generous shots of scotch. The alarm went off about three hours later. I woke strangely easily and peacefully. I can get by on six and a half hours just, and only if I'm feeling lively generally, which I hadn't been lately. Three hours sleep doesn't cut it under any conditions, but I sat up and stretched and didn't feel too bad. And I had the oddest sensation, as if someone had been in my bedroom with me. Given the events of the night before, this should have been panic stations, but it wasn't. It was a reassuring feeling, as if someone had been guarding me in my sleep. Get a grip, sunshine. I had to get moving quickly, however I was feeling, because it took so much longer to bicycle than to drive into town. But as it turned out, it didn't. When I went round to the shed to fetch Kenny's bike, there was a car parked at the edge of the road. Engine off, but SOF spotlight on, illuminating the SOF insignia on the door and the face of the man leaning against the hood. Pat. Morning, he said. We are not going to the lake at this hour, I said, half scandalized and half disbelieving. I am going to make cinnamon rolls and oatmeal bread and brownies and butter bombs, and you can call out the Calvary at about ten. Sheer, I know you're going in to make cinnamon rolls. You want to be setting some aside to bring with you later on. 
The only good Monday is a holiday Monday when Charlie's is open, but we figured that Mel would bring you home last night, which would leave you with only two unmotorized wheels this morning, and we don't want you tired this afternoon. Tired but alive would do, I thought. Dawn isn't for another hour and a half, and if I'm the first person to stake a, su a sucker with a table knife, I could be the first person to get plucked off a bicycle. I had been thinking about this as I walked downstairs in the dark. Living alone has its advantages in terms of warding. Your wards don't get confused, nor do they blunt as fast as they will if there are several of you. A big family with a lot of friends will go for wards like the set-ins for popcorn on Monday nights. And unless you are so fabulously wealthy that you can spend millions on made-to-order wards, there are always going to be some holes in the barrier. Someone living alone who isn't constantly having different people over can probably build up a pretty good, solid home ward system. That's probably. But wards are unstable at best, and they tend to blow up or fall over or go rogue to get their attributes crossed, or get their attributes crossed and morph into something else, almost certainly something you don't want pretty easily. And generally speaking, the more powerful they are, the more likely they are to go nuts. And wards are the sober end of the charm family. Most of the rest of them are a lot worse. One of the most dependable ways to make a ward cally on you is to expect it to travel. All charms, including wards that you wear next to your skin, are different, hence the perennial, if problematic, popularity of tattoos. But words you hang at a distance have to, stay, have to stay put. Consequently, the eternally vexed question of warding your means of transportation. And while it's true that the chauffeur-driven limos of the Global Council are almost more ward than limo, it's also true that no council member travels anywhere without a human bodyguard stiff with technology, including to the corner store for a newspaper. If there are any Global Council members that live in neighborhoods of corner stores, which they probably aren't. The irony is that the best transport ward for us ordinary schlemials remains the confusing fact of motion itself. There's a crucial maintenance speed of a little under 10 miles per hour. This is a brisk pedal on your bicycle. And sensible joggers, if this isn't a contradiction in terms, get their exercise during the day. In the horse era, a harness or riding horse that couldn't maintain a 9 mile per hour clip for a useful distance was shot. This made horses short-lived and expensive, and most people stayed at home after dark, but at least travel was possible. The protection of movement is nothing like perfect, which is why they keep trying to create transport wards. But it exists, and thank the gods and angels for it, since without it I don't think there would be many sane humans left. There's only so much constant, relentless, constrictive dread you can live with. Anyway, I knew to be grateful for it, but it had never made much sense, at least not till a vampire had told me, it is not the distance that is crucial, but the uniformity and given me an inkling. But what kind of homogeneity is it about sucker senses? Had the goblin gigglers last sight of the human who offed him been transmitted anywhere? I'd felt relatively safe inside my apartment. I had good wards, and you can kind of feel the presence of the screen they put up, that it's there, and there aren't any big drafts coming through it, and you feel it when you come out from behind it, too. But I'd never been able to bear a charm against my skin. They made me, they make me a total space cadet. I'd agreed to the key ring loop to make mom feel good, and that was pushing it. Poor thing. It had probably been grateful to be drowned in the shower last night, if it had survived the little incident shortly before. I said to Pat unkindly, you might have thought of that last night. He grinned and opened the passenger door. I got in. Why did you draw the short straw? Because I'm best at going without sleep. My demon blood has its uses. There were at least two classes of demons who didn't sleep at all. My favorite is the Hildy demon, who gets all the sleep it needs during the blinking of its eyes. You'd think this would seriously interrupt any train of thought that takes longer to pursue than the time between one eye blink and another, but not to a Hildy. They're called Hildies after Brunhilde, Hildy, after Brunhilde, who slept for a very long time surrounded by fire. Hildies also breathe fire when they're peeved, although they're even tempered as demons go. Hildies aren't blue, though. I certainly couldn't get all the sleep I needed by blinking my eyes. 
I stayed in the bakery all morning. Charlie and Mel kept everyone who didn't belong behind the counter on the far side. Mom answered more phone calls than usual and said she has nothing to say a lot. With the bakery door open, I could sometimes hear conversations in the office. Mom is good at hanging up on people. It's one of her great assets as a small business manager. She and Consuela had lately been working up a good cop slash bad cop routine that was a joy to eavesdrop on. I had no idea what Charlie had told her about the events of the night before. I didn't want to know. But he must have told her something. Miraculously, she left me alone, although a particularly lurid new charm was waiting for me on my apron hook that morning. I left it there, glowering to itself. I like orange, but not an over-decorated feather whammies. It wasn't as bad as it might have been by a long shot. I felt some grudging admi admiration for SOF. Nobody tried to follow me when I left the coffee house at 10, or at least nobody but some of the overweight so-called wildlife that hangs around the pedestrian precinct and tries to cage handouts from the weak willed they know a white bakery bag when they see one, and I was carrying a dozen cinnamon rolls. I swear some of our sparrows are too fat to fly, but the feral cats are too fat to catch them. And the squirrels should have had teeny weeny skateboards to keep their bellies off the ground. One of the recent rumors about Mrs. Bialski's neighborhood activities was that she ran a commando unit that protected us from some of Old Town's larger, more threatening wildlife, the rats and foxes and mutant deer that never shed their short but pointy horns. If Charlie's had had to keep all of that lot too fat to intimidate anybody, we'd have gone out of business. It was just Jesse and Pat today. They put me in the front seat of an unmarked car, with Pat alone in the back. Jesse ate four cinnamon rolls and Pat ate five. I didn't think this was humanly possible, but then maybe it wasn't. I ate one. I'd had breakfast already, twice. Ten o'clock is a long time from four in the morning. We drove first to the old cabin. I was still clinging to that mysterious sense of someone keeping a protective eye on me, but I was beginning to feel a little rocky nonetheless. Maybe I should have brought the feather whammy instead of hiding it under my apron when I left. As the weed popped gravel of what had once been a driveway crunched under my feet, I put my hand in my pocket and closed it round my little knife. I had been not remembering what had happened two months ago so emphatically that the edges of my real memory had become a little indistinct. Standing on the ground where it had begun brought it horribly back. I looked at the porch where I hadn't heard them coming from. I looked at the place where my car had no longer been two days later. I went down to the marshy reach near the shore where the stream had run 15 years ago. It didn't look like anybody had been there playing in the mud recently. I went back to the cabin. Yeah, Pat was saying. But it's been a long time and they haven't been back, said Jesse. They were just standing there, no gizmos in sight, no headsets, no wires, no portable comm screens with flashing lights making beeping noises. I guess it wasn't technology that was helping them draw their conclusions. What a good thing Pat hadn't walked on my porch this morning and up my stairs and knocked on my door and maybe walked into the front room where the same if savagely stain-removed, the sofa still stood, and the little square of carpet beside it, and maybe even the handle of the fridge door, the same handle that had been there ready to expose a carton of milk behind it if someone pulled on it two months ago. What a good thing that good, man that good manners dictate that you don't idly cross people's probable outer ward circle and knock on their doors unless invited. Carthaginian Hill we got back in the car and drove on the way we'd been going, north. There was a bad spot almost at once. I picked it up first, or anyway, I was the one who said, hey, I don't know about you, but I don't want to go any further this way. Farther this way. Roll up your windows, said Jesse. He hit a couple of buttons on the very peculiar dashboard I was only now noticing, and suddenly there was something like heavy body armor enclosing me, oppressive as chain mail and breastplate and a full face helm, plume and ladies silk favor optional. I could almost smell the metal polish. Ugh, I said. Don't knock it, it works, said Jesse. Our voices echoed peculiarly. We drove very slowly for about a minute, and then a red light on the dashboard blinked, and there was a manic chirping like a parakeet on speed. Right, we're clear. He hit the same buttons. The invisible armor went away. Spartan, isn't it, said Pat. No, I said. 
We drove through two more bad spots like that, and I hated the body armor program worse each time. It made me feel trapped. It made me feel as if when I woke up again, I'd be sitting at the edge of a bonfire with a lot of vampires on the other side. It was a long drive, 30 miles or so, I remembered. Then we reached a really bad spot. Jesse hit his buttons again, but this time it really was like being trapped. Held down while things slid through the intangible gaps between the incorporeal links, reached out long taloned fingers and grabbed me. Big, huge space, indoors, sealing up there somewhere, old factory, scaffolding where the workers had once tended the machines, no windows, enormous square ventilator shafts, Vast, parasitic humps of silent machinery, contortions of piping like the worm Ouroboros in its death throes, and eyes, eyes, staring, their gaze like flung acid, no color, what color is evil? When I came to, I was screaming. I stopped. Even the guys looked shaken. I could see the scuff marks in the road ahead of us, where Jesse had slammed us into reverse. Good thing the driver hadn't gone under. I put my hands over my mouth. Sorry, I said. Nah, said Pat. If you hadn't been screaming, I'd have had to do it. What now, said Jesse. They both looked at me. Maybe this is the really big bad spot behind the house, I said. I told you there was one. We're pretty well north of the lake now, aren't we? Seems like we've come far enough, but I keep losing the lake behind the trees. Yeah, said Jesse. The road's well back here because this is where the big estates are, were. Okay, I said, so we walk. I opened the car door and clambered stiffly out. This was harder than it would have been if I hadn't been squashed by SOF technology four times, especially the last time when it didn't work. I patted my stomach as if checking to make sure I was still there. I seemed to be. The cut on my breast was itching like crazy, the sort of variable itch that reinforces its performance by regular nerve fraying jabs of pain. My jackknife seemed to be trying to burn a hole through its cotton pocket to my leg. I wrapped my hand around it. The heat was presumably illusory, which perhaps explained why the sense of being fried felt so comforting. I set off through the trees without looking behind me. They'd follow, and I had to get myself moving before I thought much about it, or I wouldn't do it at all. I didn't bother trying to figure out where the bad spot ended. I went down to the shore of the lake and turned right. Walking on the shore, while, while awkward, all shingle and teetery stones and water tossed, Rubbish wasn't so bad as walking through the trees. I was in sunlight out here, and the memories were under the trees. I hadn't walked on the shore before. It was the right bad spot. I came to the house much too soon. I could half convince myself I was enjoying walking by the lake. I like walking by water in the sunshine. I'd often enjoyed walking by this lake. Before, I stopped, feeling suddenly sick and waited for the other two to catch up with me. I'm not sure I can do this, I said, and my voice had started to go funny again as it had last night when I told them you don't hear vampires coming. It's daylight and we're with you, said Jesse, not unsympathetically. I said abruptly, what if we get back to the car and it won't start? We'd never get out of these woods before dark. It'll start, said Pat. You're okay. Hold on. We're going to walk up the hill toward the house real slow. You just keep breathing. I'm walking up on your left, and Jesse is walking up on your right. We'll go as slow as you want. Hey, Jesse, how's your nephew doing with that puppy he talked your folks into buying him? It was well done. Puppy stories got me to the stairs. By that time, Pat had me by the elbow because I was gasping like a puffer demon, except they always breathe like that. But having a hand on my elbow was too much like having been frog-marched up those stairs the last time I'd been here. No, I said, thanks, but let me go. Last time, you know, I had help. The porch steps creaked under my weight, like last time. Unlike last time, the steps also creaked under the weight of my companions. Almost dreamily, I went through the still ajar front door and left across the huge hall toward the ballroom. It was daylight now, so I could look up and see where the curl of Grand Staircase became an upstairs corridor lined by what had once been an equally ground balustrade, but some of the posts were cracked or missing. There were still glints of gold paint in the hollows of the carving. In the dark, I hadn't known the railings were anything but smooth. I wouldn't have cared. The ballroom was smaller than I remembered. It was still a big room, much bigger than anything but a ballroom, 
But in my memory, it had become about the size of a small country, and in fact, it was only a room. As ballrooms go, it probably wasn't even a big one. The chandelier, very shabby in daylight, still had candle stubs in it, and there was a lot of dripped wax on the floor underneath. There was my corner and the windows on either wall that had bounded my world for two long nights and a day in between. I shuddered. Steady sunshine, said Pat. I had been worrying about the shackles in the walls. I was going to have to revert to not remembering when Pat and Jesse asked me about the second shackle, the one with the ward signs on it. There were no shackles, just holes in the walls. I almost laughed. Thanks, Bo, I said silently. You've done me a favor. Pat and Jesse were examining the holes, Pat still half keeping an eye on me. The holes looked like they'd been torn, as if the shackles had been ripped out of the walls by someone in a rage, by some vampire. No human could have done it, but I guess the rage part was accurate, a frustrated, possibly frightened rage, or on orders. On orders, I thought. I doubted Bo's gang did anything that Bo hadn't told them to do first, but what but however it had happened, I didn't have to explain a shackle with ward signs on it. They did, of course, want to know about the second set of holes. This is where I was, I said, pointing to the holes near the corner. And this, said Jesse, kneeling in front of the other holes. I don't remember, I said automatically. There was a silence. Can we have an agreement, maybe, said Pat, that you stop saying I don't remember and do us the kindness of telling the truth, which is that you're not going to say what you remember? There was a longer silence. Pat was looking at me. I met his eyes. He had held his breath till he turned blue last night. He'd already made up his mind to trust me, even knowing that I was lying about what had happened. That made me feel pretty bad until it occurred to me that there was another angle on last night's demonstration. Not only that Pat and Jesse and Theo were willing to trust me, but that they understood sometimes you had the lie. Okay, I said. So, said Jesse, the second set of holes. I took a deep breath. I'm not going to tell you. Okay, said Jesse. I think these holes are from another shackle. If it had been empty while you were here, Ray, you wouldn't mind telling us that. So there must have been another prisoner, and it's this other prisoner you aren't going to tell us about. I didn't say anything. Interesting, said Jesse. Pat stared out one of the windows, frowning. Shackles in a ballroom aren't standard equipment, so the suckers will have put them in special. The thing is, the space cleared around this house has been done recently, too. You have to assume they did that as well. Why? I could keep silent on this one a little more easily. It seemed pretty weird if you didn't know, and this one they couldn't guess, I hoped. They went off to look at the rest of the house. I stayed in the ballroom. I sat on the window sill nearest my shackle, the one on the long wall, the window I'd peed out of, the window I'd knelt in front of when I'd changed my knife to a key. The lake looked a lot like it had the day I'd been here, another blue, clear day. It was hotter today, though, summer rather than spring. I leaned back against the side of the window and thought about cinnamon rolls and muffins and brownies and the cherry tarts I'd started experimenting with, since Charlie had ordered an electric cherry pitter out of a catalog and gave it to me hopefully. Charlie's idea of post-traumatic shock therapy, a new kitchen gadget. I thought about the pleasure of... sitting in bright sunlight. With two humans an easy call, I might have opened my collar and let the sun shine there, but I had the gash ta taped up, and I wasn't going to risk Pat or Jesse seeing it. I thought about the fact that Mel, easygoing, laid-back, mind-your-own-business Mel, kept nagging me to look for a doctor who could do something about it, and found my refusal inexplicable and dumb. Jesse and Pat came back into the ballroom and hunkered down on the floor in front of me in my window. There was a silence. I didn't like this. I wanted to leave. I wanted to get away from the lake, from what had happened here, from being reminded of what had happened here. I'd done what they'd asked. I'd found them the house. I didn't want to talk about this stuff anymore. I wanted to go back to the car and make sure it was going to start and get us out of here before sundown. I wanted to sit in the sun somewhere other than beside the lake. So last night, said Jesse, what happened? I don't, I said. Pat looked at me and I smiled faintly. I wasn't going to say I don't remember. I was going to say I don't know. It was, it was like instinctive, except who has that kind of instinct? If it was an instinct, it was a really stupid instinct. 
Except that it worked, Pat said dryly. So you didn't think, aha, there's a sucker a couple of streets over. I think I'll go stake the bastard. Never mind that I don't know how I know it's there or that I'm going to stake it with a goddamn table knife. No, I said, I didn't think at all. I didn't think from the time I, I stood up from where I was sitting at the counter to when, when Jesse had hold of me and was yelling that it was all over. So why did you stand up and pick up a table knife and take off at a speed that wouldn't have shamed an Olympic sprinter? Um, I said, well, I heard him, um, and I didn't like having him on my ground. I was um, angry, I guess. Heard him? Heard him what? Nobody else heard anything. Heard him, um, giggle, silence. Was this by any chance a sucker from two months ago, Pat said gently, from what happened here? Yes. Can you tell us any more? He's the one that made this mark on me, I thought, the slice in my flesh that won't close. You could say I had a score to settle. That doesn't explain why I managed to settle it, though. He was, he was the other one that had hold of me coming here. I don't know how many of them there were all together. A dozen, maybe. I thought of the second evening, the twelve of them fanning out around me and the prisoner of the other shackle coming closer, slowly coming closer, how I'd been pressing myself against the wall so hard my spine hurt. Most of them didn't say anything. The one, I think, was the breather. He seemed to be giving the orders. I thought of him as, as the lieutenant of the raiding party. He talked, and he held one of my arms bringing me here. This, the one from last night, he held my other arm. He talked. He was the one with the sense of humor. Her feet are already bleeding, if you like feet. The lieutenant of the raiding party, said Jesse thoughtfully. That sounds like there was a colonel back at headquarters. You'd expect that, a setup as elaborate as this one, said Pat. This is a gang run by a master vampire. They both looked at me. Do you know anything about the master, said Jesse? I could have said I'm not going to tell you. I said no. <coughs> there was another silence. I tried not to squirm. This should be when the SOFs revert to type and start yelling at me for withholding important information and so on. We have a problem, you see, Sunshine, said Pat at last. Okay, we know you're not telling us everything, but, well, I probably shouldn't be telling you this, but that happens oftener than you might think, people not telling SOF everything. Hell, SOF not telling SOF everything. I mean, aside from the nomad blood of guys like Jesse and me, we could probably live with that if that was all it was. We wouldn't like it, maybe, but we've had a lot of practice not being told everything, and if you get too pissed off at people, then they really won't talk to you. But you've done something pretty well unprecedented, twice. You got away from a bunch of vampires, alone, and out in the middle of nowhere. It happens occasionally that a sucker gang gets a little carried away, teasing some kid from a human gang that has been jiving in the wrong place, hoping to see vampires. The kid gets a little cut up, but we take him to the hospital and they stitch him up and give him his shots and he goes home good as new, if a little more prone to nightmares than he used to be. It doesn't happen that a young woman alone in a wilderness gets away from a sucker gang so determined to keep her they have her chained to the wall. So far as I know, it hasn't ever happened before. I wished he would stop saying alone. He hadn't forgotten the second set of holes in the wall any more than I had. Thank the gods at least the telltale shackle itself was gone. And that's only the first thing. The second thing is that you sauntered up to a sucker last night that in the first place you had no way of knowing was there. In the second place he stood there while you staked him without any warning or any backup. And in the third place staked him with a stainless steel table knife. People have staked suckers without backup, but they've never done it by running up to one in full sight. And they sure as suckers hate daylight don't do it with a goddamn table knife. I pulled the research on it that proves it can't be done last night. Stainless steel is a no-hoper even if you've had the best ward crafters and charm cutters in the business. Do their number on it first. I told you I don't need much sleep. I spent the rest of last night going through the files for anything about sucker escapees and unusual stakings. There isn't much. Clarice, no. There isn't much, and nothing at all like you, sunshine. 
We ought to put all this in our report and pass it up on the line, and then you'd get a horde of SOF experts down on you like nothing you've ever imagined. And speaking of shackles, you'd probably spend the rest of your life chained to the goddess of pain's desk. She'd love you. But we don't want to, because we need you. We need you in the field. Dear friggin' gods and angels, do we ever need you in the field. We need anything we can get, because frankly, we're losing. You didn't know that, did you? At the moment, we still got the nails nail, the news nailed shut. But it isn't going to stay nailed shut. Another hundred years tops and the suckers are going to be running our show. The wars were just a distraction. We think we won. Well, maybe we did, but we skegged our future doing it. It blows, but it's the way it is. So little grubby guys like me and Jesse feel we need you in the field a hell of a lot more than we need you disappeared into some study program while they try to figure out how you've done what you've done and how they could make a, a lot of other people do it too. Which they wouldn't be able to because it's going because it's going to turn out not to work that way. And we guess you don't want to be disappeared either. I shook my head on a suddenly stiff neck. Yeah, so anyway, if you can off suckers with common household utensils, we want you out there doing it. We'll even lie to the goddess of pain about you to keep you to ourselves, and babe, that takes balls. Would they still want me out there doing what I could do if they knew what else I could do, if they knew the truth about the second shackle? Were the vampires really going to win within the next hundred years? When we got back to the car, it started the first time. There wasn't much conversation. We were most of the way back to town when Pat said, Hey, sunshine, talk to us. What are you thinking? I'm trying not to think. I'm, I stopped. I didn't know if I could say it aloud, even to make my point. I'm trying not to think about those stains on the walls in the alley last night. There was a pause. I'm sorry, said Jesse. We do have some idea what we're asking you. Don't let Pat's pleasure in his own rhetoric get to you. Hey, said Pat. I haven't been your age in a long time, Jesse went on, and I grew up wanting to join SOF. I knew it was going to be bad, what I was going to be doing if I stayed a field agent, which I wanted to be. And it is bad, a lot of it, a lot of the time. You get used to it because you have to, and SOF doesn't throw you in like you've been thrown in. Last night was rough, even for a grizzled old vet like me. Ray, we aren't asking you to make a decision to save the world tomorrow, but please think about what Pat said. Think about the fact that we really, really need you. And think, for what it's worth, that we'll back you up to the last gasp if you want us there, if last gasp stuff turns out to be necessary. And just by the way, kiddo, said Pat in his mildest voice, I'm not accusing you of anything, okay, but it must be 50 miles from here back to where you live with that weird Siddhartha type. I ain't saying it's not possible, sunshine, but that's a hell of a hike for anyone, let alone someone who's spent two days chained to a wall expecting to die. I'm thinking your last gasp is pretty worth having. I stared out the window, thinking about the second shackle. I got for dessert shift that night on autopilot. Nobody asked me how my afternoon had gone, and I didn't volunteer anything. The atmosphere of repressed anxiety was thick enough to cut chunks out of and fry, however. I wondered what you'd have on the side with a plate of deep-fried anxiety. Pickles, cold slaw, potato strychnine mash. Things were so fraught that Kenny came into the bakery long enough to say, Hey, big sis, and give me a hug. He hadn't called me big sis since the time he was eight and I was 18, and I'd caught him spying on my then-boyfriend, Rick. Raul and me, and he went around the house yelling big sissy kissy kissy and I sent Raul home and went into my brother's room and destroyed the backup disc to every one of their com box games that I could find, which was a lot. You might think this was overreacting, Mom, Charlie, and Billy did, but I was lucky he'd only caught us kissing and I wanted to be sure I'd been discouraging enough about this sort of fraternal behavior. Anyway, neither Kenny nor Billy spoke to me at all for about six months, by which time I'd graduated, the big sis era was over, and shortly after that I'd moved into my own apartment. Mary took her break in the bakery again and told me the latest Mr. Cagney story, but her heart wasn't in it. I'm okay, I said, really. I know you are, she said, but she hugged me anyway and got streaks of flour and cinnamon all down her front. 
I was due to stay till closing, but they packed me off an hour early. I didn't argue. I fetched a wreck and drove home slowly. I was so tired. Bone tired, marrow tired. What comes after that? Life tired. That's the kind of tired I was. It wasn't just lack of sleep tired, though I did have a few fuzzy cobwebs at the corners of my vision. I could hear some of Mom's charms moving around in the glove compartment. Once a charm has been given someone's name, if that someone doesn't snap it and let it go live, it may pop itself and try to come after you. When I opened the glove compartment to put a new one in now, half a dozen of the old ones tried to climb up my arm. They were probably all totally cracked from driving around in a car, though. It had been dark for two hours. The moon was rising. I thought about trying to talk Charlie into keeping the coffee house open 24 hours, drive those inferior primetime brownies right out of town. Then I could never leave the coffee house again for the rest of my life. Pat and Jesse would be disappointed, of course, and we'd have to gear hard after the insomniac market to keep the customer flow up all night long since you can't board a restaurant, but these were mere practical problems. The thing that really bothered me was that I'd have to tell everyone why. <clears throat> that there was a vampire, a master vampire, and his gang after me, specifically the ones I'd got away from two months ago, and it turns out suckers are poor losers and persistent bastards. Then maybe I was the first bad magic wuss in history. The lab coat brigade would probably want to do exhaustive research on my mother's child rearing techniques, as well as on my blood chemistry. Academic prunes would write papers if they knew, if I lost it and they found out. There was a light on in Yolandi's part of the house, spilling across the porch and toward the drive. I still went up my own stairs in the dark. There was a hall light, but electric light in that narrow windowless way made me feel claustrophobic. When I got upstairs and bolted the door behind me, I still didn't turn the light on. I had another cup of chamomile tea on the dark balcony. Moonlight was beginning to glimmer through the trees at the edge of the garden, and I turned off thinking. I sat there listening to the almost silence. There were tiny rustling noises, the hoot of an owl, the soft stirring of the wind through leaves, external leaves, internal leaves. <laughs>